Good morning, church, and welcome to worship on this Pentecost Sunday. Yesterday, I had the chance to spend some time with Reverend John Lee from Mount Zion Baptist Church, and he told me uh, that he had this scripture from Isaiah on his heart, and so I thought it would be appropriate for us to listen to this text in Isaiah chapter 59, verses 9 through 11, as we open our hearts to God in worship. So justice is far from us, and righteousness does not reach us. We look for light, but all is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in deep shadows. Like the blind, we grope along the wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. At midday, we stumble as if it were twilight. Among the strong, we are like the dead. We all growl like bears and moan mournfully like doves. We look for justice, but find none. For deliverance, but it is far away. This morning, church, I want to remind you that lament is also a form of worship. As we wake up this morning, to more bad news, as we long for no person to be judged by the color of their skin, as we pray for violence to stop and for true transformation to come in its place. We come to worship not to leave behind the troubles of the world, but to place them on God's altar so that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus. Church, I wish we were together in person today. So let us take a moment and remember that we are still worshiping as one church in many places. So let us worship God with all of our hearts and all of our souls and all of our strength. As we go to God in prayer this morning, we lift up Nathan Lipscomb, who's in a lot of pain following his surgery, but is uh, healing back at home. We also continue to pray for Julie Boca and Peggy Jones, who both had surgery this week, but both surgeries went well. William Thalman's Aunt Judy passed away yesterday evening, so we lift up William and his Uncle Ned as they grieve this loss. Holly Acridge's father, David, who we've been praying for, passed away early Saturday morning from COVID-19. 
Our prayers are with Holly, her wife Patty, who is on the COVID unit at the med center, her mother, and the rest of her family. 100,000 lives lost to this virus. Lord, hear our prayers. I can't breathe, George Floyd said, as an officer knelt on his throat, cutting off his airway and killing him. How much longer, O oh Lord? I imagine our friends and neighbors of color shouting these words of lament from Psalm 43. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people from those who are deceitful and unjust. Deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you cast me off? Why must I walk about mournfully because of the oppression of the enemy? Lord, hear our prayers led by Mike Holian. Let's pray. As we gather this Pentecost Sunday, we kneel before you and ask the Holy Spirit to come into our lives as we deal with this terrible epidemic which surrounds our country. Like the apostles of old, brand our hearts with the flame of the power of the Holy Spirit. Brand us with your holy fire so that what is outward, our words, and our actions, our joys, and our enthusiasm will make it abundantly clear and obvious that we are yours. Whirlwind Spirit of God, roar through our hearts and minds, sweep away the cobwebs of our apathy, and blow down the wall that separates us one from another. Help us to love and cherish one another. Fight to fight for injustice and share the miracle of the spoken languages with others within our community to proclaim the good news of a risen Christ. And Father God, let not even one person leave this worship hour without feeling the warm stirring of your Holy Spirit within our lives, embracing the same passion that fired the apostles at the first Pentecost celebration and help us to remember the life you gave for the kingdom of God and the resurrection we celebrated Easter Sunday. Let us now join our hearts in saying the prayer that you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly the sound of, like, like the blowing violin of a wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tons of fire that had separated and come to rest on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with the strange tongues as the Spirit prompted their utterances. Now there were then staying in Jerusalem religious Judeans from every country in the world. And when this sound was heard, numbers of people collected in the greatest excitement because each of them heard the followers speaking in his own language. In amazement and wonder, they exclaimed, these people who are talking like this are Galileans. How is it that they, all of us, hear them speaking in our own native languages? We are from Panthea, Medea, and Elam, from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, from Pontus and Asia. Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene. 
and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and manifest day. And it shall be that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, church, for sharing the good news with us this morning. Has anyone else gotten really comfortable at home? I had to laugh the other day when I called a church member who said, I'm really thriving staying at home which I'm not picking on her. I love that, by the way, all of our sweet introverts who are living the dream at home. My latest project was redecorating my bedroom, or really just decorating it for the first time since our girls were just a few months old when we moved in, so we just threw some stuff on the walls at the time. So I ordered some small pieces of furniture and I rearranged some of the art on the walls. I made myself a cozy little nook in the corner, one of the few places where I get cell service so I can catch up with church members and friends there. Now, next week we were supposed to be going to the beach but canceled our trip. So instead, I am gonna take on my guest bedroom next. The longer we are home, the more projects I find to make the most out of our space. Because this is what we have, and I want our family to be comfortable in it. In our story for today, we find the apostles gathered all together in one place. I envision them quarantined like us, tired from their grief, anxious about an unknown future, worried for their safety and for the safety of those they love. They were probably getting on each other's last nerve, but now Jesus isn't there to mitigate their arguments. And all that fear and exhaustion, I imagine that they start to get comfortable inside. Jesus had promised not to leave them alone, but I wonder, were they starting to doubt? Like, were they there waiting for the Holy Spirit? As one commentator puts it, the promise of the Holy Spirit compelled people to gather in anticipation of it. They rearranged their schedules and synchronized their calendars to make themselves available to God. Isn't that nice? I wonder, is that really how it went? Like, were they anxiously awaiting the Holy Spirit? Or was it more like when I experience God, most often an interruption, a total interruption of what has become comfortable and routine? Were they summoning God? Or did God break through their assumptions their comfortable routines, their mundane, shut-in lives, and surprise them. It was a girl's fourth 
birthday when the governor announced that pretty soon churches would be able to gather in person for worship again. For once, I actually wasn't listening to the four o'clock briefing. Instead, I had presents waiting for the girls for when they woke up from their naps, and I was watching them unwrap them with glee. They were trying on their new cowgirl boots and reading some new books. When I looked up on, at the television, which out of habit I had turned on to the four o'clock briefing, but I think I had it on mute, and I looked up and there was a graphic that caught my eye. It was that picture of a little church with a cross on top, and it listed houses of worship and a date for their re-entry into the sanctuary. I instantly turned up the volume as my heart started racing. Could it be that we could gather together again soon in the comfort of our sanctuary? Are we ready? What will it look like? I wondered. Within a couple of days, our Safer Church Committee gathered by Zoom, and it wasn't long before judicatory bodies and individual churches started making plans. Over the last several weeks, I'll admit, my eyes have glazed over reading these detailed plans for re-entry, which include everything from foot pedals to open doors to sanitizing bathrooms after every single use to worship by invitation only. This is not a church that I recognize. And as hard as I've tried to motivate myself to start a document of our own, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. And rest assured, it's not because I don't like making plans. I love making plans. Usually I color coat my outline and um, get everything just how I want it. One of my favorite parts of being your pastor is getting to cast a vision and watch it um, be fulfilled. But this is a plan that my gut wouldn't let me make. That is until last Wednesday, when I woke up on a rainy day and started checking my emails on my phone from bed. It's a really bad habit, and I don't recommend doing it. I'm on an email chain with several other pastors, and one who I particularly respect had just sent his church's plan. And so I started reading it. I got just a short way through it, but further than I had on most average plans that I had been reading before losing patience. But this time, instead of burying it, I thought, today is the day. I am going to start working on our plan, unsure of what it would look like, but feeling certain that there are plenty of good models out there. Now, it may not surprise you that FCC's plan, it doesn't look like most other churches' plans. First Christian Church is an inclusive faith community built on the love of of Christ, not a building, not a sanctuary, but a community focused on loving Jesus and making that love especially known to those people who are usually left off of the invitation list. We will stay out of our sanctuary as long as it takes for us to ensure the safety of all of God's children, including the sick the vulnerable, and the 65 and older. The church does not need a 10-page document to tell us how to be the church. As my friend Robin believes so much that she had a giant sign printed and planted it in the front of her church that sits on a busy intersection in Des Moines, Iowa. The sign says, the church is not a building. The church has a building. Amen? 
Friends, I will admit, I have gotten comfortable. We have gotten comfortable worshiping inside of this sanctuary. And it's true that each of us has at times gotten so comfortable with worshiping here on Sunday mornings that occasionally we can be guilty of thinking that if we just come to church in the sanctuary on Sunday mornings, that that is enough to make us good Christians. And look, while I do not believe that God causes things like pandemics, because I believe our God is always working for our flourishing and not our harm, I do believe that God can show up in this, like a rush of wind sending us racing out of our building and into our big, scary world. Do you notice in this story from Acts that it starts with what appears to me to be a smaller group. They are gathered together. I imagine it to be the disciples and Jesus' closest followers. And when the Holy Spirit comes, a larger group starts to gather. But not just a crowd of folks who look like them and talk like them and worship like them, a crowd of people who shouldn't even be able to hear one another because they are so different. But the Holy Spirit shows up, and all of a sudden, this beautiful rainbow of people start to see and to hear and to understand each other. If there is no other good news for us this morning, let it be that it is possible to understand each other. So I wonder, in that moment, did the Holy Spirit do some magic trick so that instantly they could understand new languages like a Rosetta Stone on steroids or something? Or was the work of the Spirit to change their hearts so that they desired to understand each other. This is what we celebrate as Pentecost or the birthday of the church. It's why we've gotten out the red in the sanctuary. It's a moment when Jesus' followers are sent out of the building into the community, out of their comfort zones, into the dangerous world, out of what is familiar and in to the unknown. And church, we are right in the middle of it. So, what are we going to do? Create a 10-page long document? Race to get back into the comfort of our sanctuary? Spend our Sunday mornings sanitizing the word of Jesus Christ? Send out invitations to those who look like us and talk like us and worship like us? to come and worship God in ways that transform nothing but make us comfortable? I don't know about you, but I am not here for that. I think maybe I could get behind the invitation idea, but if so, we had better be sending invitations down to the bridge where our homeless brothers and sisters live, and to some of the apartment complexes where groups of refugees and immigrants live in crowded apartments. And we better send an invitation to the Pride Planning Committee to let them know that your people are our people, and to our Muslim brothers and sisters saying, we are praying with you and for you because you are children of the same God. You are our neighbors, and we are in this together. Should we send invitations, maybe we should look for Jesus' 
recommended guest list. As found in the Gospel of Luke, he says, invite the poor, the lame, the ones who could never fulfill their pledge or serve on a church committee. Church, we will never have worship that is by invitation only because that isn't church. That is an exclusive social club. That isn't bowing down to Jesus, but bowing down to Caesar. That isn't driven by the rush of a holy wind, but by the chill of fear. And that is not who we are. Now, just in case you're starting to feel good about all of this, like we have really gotten this thing figured out, I would urge us all to take a step back. I deliver this message with fear and trembling, with respect for God and God's people and hope that we will be faithful in this moment. If we want to follow the spirit that is called holy, we should probably be shaking in our boots. Because y'all, If we're going to do this, we are going to renew our vows to God outside the sanctuary. Then we had better buckle our seatbelts and, as Annie Dillard would advise us, put on our crash test helmets. It is not easy to reach beyond what we want. I want to be back in this sanctuary with you. I want to hear the amazing chancel choir sing. I want to hug each of you and hold you tight. It is not easy to reach beyond what we want, but I believe we are called in this moment to ask, not what do I want, But what does God want from me for the sake of my neighbor? And as scary as that is, there is still a promise that we can hold on to. Jesus said that he would not leave us alone, but send the Holy Spirit to us, which is what we celebrate at Pentecost. And while that spirit, she will pull us to new places, she will also give us a renewed sense of purpose. The Holy Spirit will remind us who God is and who we are called to be. And in my heart of hearts, I believe we will not regret listening to God's Spirit in this moment. Now, I do have a meeting with the Safer Church Committee this afternoon, and they are the group I am grateful for because they keep me grounded when I start railing against 10-page long policies. Because the truth is, we do need some structure to keep us safe. And a lot of people have prayerfully and wisely come up with important rules around how people can re-enter the sanctuary more safely, and I am truly grateful for that. But what I am suggesting is that if we have figured out in the midst of this pandemic how we can worship together but still apart, what if we commit to staying the course a little while longer? Because I can promise you, if you spoke with Holly Acreage, who lost her dad, her beloved dad, yesterday to COVID-19. If you spoke to her wife, Patty, who cared for him faithfully, even as he took his last breath in our COVID-19 unit at the medical center in Bowling Green. 
you spoke with them, you would understand why we absolutely cannot afford to get this wrong. So I can't tell you how long it will be until we are back together in the sanctuary, but let's suppose today for the remainder of the summer. But what if we recommit to being the church during that time? Kyle and I have had to call a meeting at the Safer Church Committee today because all of a sudden, so many of our outreach ministries that have been put on hold are trying to open back up. Things like help ministry, where our churches help people out with electric bills. It is about to get real hot, y'all. Ministries like Meals, Inc. that deliver hot meals to people on Saturday mornings. Just the other day, I got an email from Dala Emerson, who is over the food program for all of Bowling Green City Schools, and she needs help, volunteers, who will help drop off food for kids in our community. And our brothers and sisters at Mount Zion, who I surely hope are in all of our prayers in this moment, they need our help with their food giveaway in Lampkin Park that happens once a month, and they are giving away food for something like a 1,000 people, which is twice or three times the amount they were giving out before the pandemic broke out. So I would love for you to consider how you are called to help. Some of us need to stay safe at home. I want you to hear that loud and clear. And that is why we are not yet ready to come back together for corporate worship. But some of you might be ready to get out and volunteer in the community. If you're a family with young kids, I would recommend that you might like to sign up for a day to work at our food bank. You sit outside, it's contact-free, and it is a great chance to teach your kids what it means to be the church. So this summer, we are going to be getting y'all information as a part of worship every Sunday about volunteer opportunities. But don't worry, it's not just going to be for people who are ready to get out of their homes and volunteer. It's also going to be other opportunities like the Poor People's Campaign, mass digital gathering, where you can lift your voice and educate yourself and hear the voices of marginalized people and learn about justice issues from home. This week, anyone who can access Facebook can access a virtual gathering that's hosted by the NAACP and local churches at 6 p.m. on Thursday, where we will be praying around these issues of racism. In this moment, it matters for us to listen to the voices of people who have brown skin and are feeling unsafe or afraid. Now, for those who are ready to get out and volunteer, I want you to wear a mask and practice social distancing. And I understand, please, please do what feels safe for the perimeters you have set for yourself and your family. These are difficult times and personal choices about what we are ready to get out and do. So, happy birthday, church. I am so proud of who we are and who we are becoming. I am so grateful for the saints who I feel on this Pentecost Sunday surrounding us who had the guts to follow the Holy Spirit and do what was right even when it wasn't popular. And while I do not have a 10-page long document that outlines our way forward, I have a deep faith in the leadership of our church who has prayerfully and thoughtfully led us through these uncharted waters, our elders, our board members, our outreach and safer church and finance committees. And I have a trust for the strength of our bond inside or outside the sanctuary. I believe 
that the Holy Spirit has breathed life into our community before and is doing so again, even as we worship today. So church, now is our Pentecost moment. The Holy Spirit is here among us. Church, it no longer feels like it's a noun, but a verb. To church is to seek to understand those who are different. To church is to stay connected with those who are feeling disconnected from their church family right now. To church is to love our neighbor who is hungry, who is poor, who is sick. To church is to worship faithfully inside or outside of our sanctuary walls. To church is to reach beyond what makes us comfortable because we love God and we love our neighbor that much. So, let's go church. On Pentecost, they gathered quite early in the day, a band of Christ's disciples to worship, sing, and pray. A mighty wind came blowing, filled all the swirling air, and tongues of fire a-glowing inspired each person there. The people all around them were startled and amazed to understand their language. As Christ the Lord they praised. What universal message, what great good news was here, that Christ, once dead, is risen to vanquish all our fear. Here at this table, God pours the Holy Spirit on all who would believe, on women, men, and children who would God's grace receive. That spirit knows no limits, bestowing life and power. The church formed and reforming responds in every hour. Let us respond together to this precious gift. All are welcome at Christ's table. On the night that Jesus gathered with his friends and disciples, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he blessed the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant poured out for all. Do this also in remembrance of me. This is the bread of life and the cup of God's love for you, and all are welcome at Christ's table. Let us pray. Loving God, whose divine lungs exhaled the Spirit into our world, your breath continues to transform our world from the still to the stirring. On this day of Pentecost, when we celebrate the breath of the Spirit coming upon the disciples, we invite the Spirit to come upon these elements. God of winds, pour out your spirit to make the elements come alive for us. Make this meal awaken our sleepy hearts and stagnant souls. On this Pentecost, as we come to the table, let us celebrate the spirit of resurrection and the promise of a needed second wind in our own lives. Thank you for this meal, and thank you for your Holy Spirit. Amen. As you serve those whom you are with today, we invite you to say the bread of life and the cup of God's love for you after saying their name. Following communion, you are invited to a moment of silence for reflection. Megan, the bread of life and the cup of God's love for you. Kyle, this is the bread of life and the cup of God's love for you.
Amen. As we conclude our worship service this morning, I'm going to remind you, as I do every week, that you can continue giving your gifts to the church by mailing in a check or dropping your check in our locked mailbox that is near our front entrance. You can also give to the church by making a gift online. This morning, I am submitting a gift online because um, I wanted to see how it worked. I usually uh, give my tithe through a bill pay through my bank, um, and I, I thought I would give a gift live in worship this morning because I was planning on going to the beach with my family this week, but we decided that now wasn't the time for us to go. And so I thought that I would give a gift to the church um, for the amount of one of the meals we would have gone out for. Usually um, one night during our trip, we'll all go out to eat. And so um, since we're not going to be able to do that, I am going to submit a gift to the church now um, to support the church since I won't be on that trip. My credit card was denied. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no laughs in the sanctuary. Um, so um, I'm just kidding. I think my gift's going to go through. So um, I wanted to share with you this morning, um, giving, I'm giving a gift that is above and beyond my tithe this week because um, as the finance committee and the church leadership is paying uh, close attention to our weekly giving, since we are in this unknown time, we noticed in the last few weeks that our giving has gone slightly down. And so um, we're trying to stay aware of that and keep you informed of that. Uh, when this all started, we had a dip in our giving, and I shared that with you, and you were so faithful. We had a few people make large gifts to support the ministry of the church. We had a lot of people make um, first-time gifts online or set up recurring gifts, and we are so grateful for that. So if you, I know there are some that have lost employment or who have seen um, a cut to their paycheck, and this is not to make you feel guilty. Part of the reason that I'm giving today is because um, I can give a little bit extra, and so I hope you see that as those of us who can doing it on your behalf. And also because in these times where um, there's a lot of things not making us feel great, when we're feeling stuck at home, not getting to do the things we normally get to do, it feels good to give, whether that's giving a financial gift or giving the gift of your time. As uh, I reminded you this morning, the church is not confined to a building. We are continuing to be the hands and feet of God in our community. And so I thank you for your gifts that continue to support the ministry of Jesus Christ through our congregation. This morning, I have a few announcements to lift up. Um, we are going to be sending out devotional, self-guided devotional books um, for Sunday school throughout the months of June and July, and those are going to be put in the mail tomorrow. A big thank you to Donna and Crystal and to all of our Sunday school teachers who have contributed to that. I want to really encourage you um, to take advantage of this booklet. Um, we intentionally decided we were not going to offer another online opportunity, but give you the chance to have some respite from your phone, from your laptop, from your devices, and instead to open the Word of God and to spend some time um, in, in quiet with God um, as you read these devotions each Sunday. Um, our Sunday school teachers have provided them, and we are really grateful for that because we miss each other. We miss seeing each other's faces, and so I can't wait to open my booklet and to see um, the different faces and hear from them. Also, um, we are going to have... Um, we are going to continue B&B, &B, which is our Bible study, Bible and Beverage. It has been really exciting to be a part of the last couple of weeks and really engaging. Um, we are potentially going to change the time, but not this week, because the virtual prayer service will be at 6. So we are going to keep B&B &B at 5 o'clock this week, but we might move it later for, a future, for future dates, because we've heard from some of you that 5 o'clock is a little bit too early. But join us this week for B&B. &B. We're going to start using uh, the sermon text, so we'll talk about Acts 2 this week. And finally, uh, I want to thank Pat Panky, who provided our flowers for the table this morning. This is a part of how um, Paul records the music for each Sunday, um, and it's a nice way that we still feel connected with our members. So thank you, Pat, for that. Will you rise for our benediction? 
God, we give you thanks that the church is more than a building. And we recommit today to opening our eyes and our ears and our hearts to the places your Holy Spirit is sending us. God, continue to teach us what it means to church. We love you and we give you thanks for the opportunity to worship you together. Go in peace. Amen.